Hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming here today. My name is Penny Wright. Most of you, you know, but we have a couple of new faces, so welcome. From the little group of books I see here on the lectern, I can see we're in for something special. But that is no surprise because Simon Van Bowie happens to be one of our favorite people. Not to mention authors, but just you know, human beings. And we're always happy when we think of an excuse to have him here, and it hasn't been for a while, but today is one of them. Um, for those of you who don't know much about Simon, he's the author of 10 books of fiction for children and adults, along with three anthologies of philosophy. His short story collection, which is titled Love Begins in Winter, won the prestigious 2009 Frank O'Connor International Short Story Award, which is the most celebrated award in the, you know, for short story writers in, in the world. Um, his books have been translated into many languages and optioned for film. Simon has also written for the New York Times, the Financial Times, NPR, and the BBC. And in 2013, he founded Writers for Children, a project which helps young people build confidence in their storytelling abilities through annual awards. Simon lectures part-time at the School of Visual Arts in New York City and serves his community as an auxiliary police officer. So beware. <laughs> he loves building robots, model airplanes, and off-the-road vehicles, which he likes to crash, and has an impressive umbrella collection. Raised in rural Wales and England, Simon currently lives between Brooklyn and Miami with his wife who is at this table. We're very happy to have her here. Um, ro robot, rabbit boy, and a fully grown sheep. Please welcome Simon Van Boone. Yeah, that sounds like my dream retirement, actually. Uh, how is everybody? I'm glad you came out. Nice to see you. Um, so Valentine's Day is almost upon us, um, and um, I could talk about that, but unfortunately it involves murder, so it's probably a good subject for love anyway. Um, so I'm going to read uh, extracts and talk about um, different um, ways to look at love, and also historically how our ancestors, because now we know through DNA that we're all related, um, how our ancestors um, saw love, and how they they probably experienced love in the way we do, but they, in all likelihood, they would have valued different aspects of it. Um, for instance, as you probably know, in 11th century England, the type of love that was most publicly revered was the type between men uh, in battle. Um, so the idea of sacrificing oneself for the group Instead, rather than, you know, today when you say love to somebody, they immediately think, you know, a couple, sort of what we consider to be a romantic relationship. Um, so uh, I suppose in, in military circles, that idea of, of self-sacrifice um, and, you know, protecting one's fellows rather than following some political ideal is probably what motivates most of the soldiers I've met. Um, is just you know the attachments they form to one another um, under those circumstances. Um, the um, the uh, earliest love poem is I think Sumerian, and it was found etched into a uh, etched into a, a tablet. Um, and uh, but I like to think that the the hand marks made in ancient caves, such as Vildmanischlag and Laskau in France. I like to think that those, those handprints serve as a, a testament to how our ancestors really reveled in intimacy with one another. Because, um, you know, while some people just see them as um, a, a primitive form of art, if you think about it, you know, our ancestors' lives were very, very difficult. Uh, and they have been up until fairly recently. Um, so if you had a, a child who would put their hand in the ink and then go to the back of the cave and make that print, when they get eaten by a saber-toothed tiger, 
or they succumb to some you know, unknown disease that now we can cure with a tiny pill. Um, I can imagine as a parent myself going to the back of the cave and putting my hand over the thinking, yeah, you know, we missed them. Um, so, even though they would have lived with much more hardship, um, I think that it's interesting to think that how the way that we think about those people we love, they would have had that very same level of devotion and uh, depth of feeling. Um, so the first, uh, I'm going to read you an introduction from a little book. As I stand here today, someone somewhere is falling in love. A child is calling out to someone in the darkness as she awakes from a bad dream. Someone is sitting alone in a car, missing someone as rain pelts the windshield. Someone is leaning on a desk, anticipating happiness he hopes love will one day bring. Perhaps someone very, very old is looking out a window, wishing that he had said yes, instead of walking away on that snowy afternoon in 1951. No matter what we do, love saturates our lives in every possible way. Even when we try to escape, it finds us, if merely to tease us with what we could have had. Through the readings uh, and quotes that I'm going to talk about today, uh, it'll hopefully give you a slightly broader range of what love means to people throughout the ages. Um, so. I could start with the Torah, but I see you, some of you already yawning. So um, <laughs> let's uh, let me start with um, some ancient Asian ideas. So as you as you're well aware, in the West we are raised with the idea that nature is a corrupting force. You know, in Judeo-Christian uh, mythology, you know Eve is tempted by a serpent, you know, to eat from the tree of knowledge, which probably would have been a pomegranate. Um, and then, you know, everything goes pear-shaped after that. Um, so, you know, we're raised with this idea that you have, to, you have to be careful and not be corrupted by seemingly natural forces. In Asia, uh, people are raised, not that nature is a corrupting force, but actually that nature is something that we have to reconcile. Meaning, uh, people in Asian uh, societies have the idea that um, happiness and success is about finding harmony with nature and with the environment so that we can take our place in the great cycle of, of things. Um, so with that in mind, of course, uh, in Asia, you know, it's largely believed that there have been three paths to wisdom, or what we might call love. And the first obviously came with uh, uh, philosopher Lao Tzu, who wrote the Tao Te Ching. Um, and uh, he, he specialized in, um, in um, our relationship with the universe, with nature. And then came Confucius, uh, who specialized in um, our relationship to society and to one another, hierarchies and things like that. And then famous Buddha, most famous of all, um, he specialized in our relationship to what we consider the self, but which may not be the self, if that makes any sense. Um, so the inner relationship, the journey within. Um, and so when you visit China, even though people might not be practicing Taoists or Buddhists, um, you can see it, it's really largely embedded in, in the culture. Um, so let me read to you something from a Vietnamese Buddhist monk about love. To love in the context of Buddhism is, above all, to be there. But being there is not easy. Some training is necessary. We need practice. If you're not there, how can you love? Being there is very much an art. The art of meditation, because meditating is bringing your true presence to the here and now. The question that arises is, do you have time to love? I know a boy of 12 whose father asked him one day, Son, what would you like for a birthday present? And the boy didn't know how to answer his father, who was a very rich man and able to buy anything for his son. But the boy did not want anything except his father's presence. 
because the role the father played kept him very busy, he didn't have time to devote to his wife and children. Being rich can be an obstacle to loving. When you're rich, you want to continue to be rich, so you end up devoting all your time and your energy in your daily life to staying rich. If this father were to understand what true love is, he would do whatever is necessary to find time to be with his wife and children. The most precious gift you can give to the one you love is your true presence. What must we do to really be there? Those who practice Buddhist meditation know that meditating is above all being present to yourself, but to those you love and to life. So I propose a very simple practice to you, mindful breathing. Breathing, I know that I'm breathing in, breathing, I know that I'm breathing out, just that. If you do this with a little concentration, you'll be able to be really there. Because in our daily lives, our minds and our bodies are rarely together. Our body might be there, but our mind is somewhere else. Maybe you're lost in regrets about the past. Maybe in worries about the future. Or else you're preoccupied with your plans, with anger, or with jealousy. You see, your mind is not really there with your body. Between the mind and the body, there's something that can serve as a bridge the moment you begin to practice breathing. Your body and your mind begun, begun, begin to come together with one another. It only takes about 20 seconds to accomplish this miracle called the oneness of body and mind. If the father I was talking about had known all this, he would have begun to breathe in and breathe out mindfully. And then one or two minutes later, he would have approached his son, who would have looked at him and said, I'm here for you. And this is the greatest gift you can give someone you love. Um, so I'll come back to him, because he's quite interesting. Uh, and you know, with Buddhist monks, they look like they're in their 50s, and they're like 130. Um, so here's another uh, poem from um, Asia, but this is, is ancient. My daily affairs are quite ordinary, but I'm in total harmony with them. I don't hold on to anything, but I don't reject anything. Nowhere do I have an obstacle or conflict. Who cares about wealth and honor? Even the poorest thing shines. My miraculous power is spiritual activity, drawing water and carrying wood. So that idea of, of uh, being in the moment is very important in, in Asian um, ideology. Um, one person, of course, that I mentioned was, uh, was Lao Tzu, the, uh, the Chinese, the Chinese uh, philosopher who apparently, Lao Tzu in, in Mandarin just means old person. So we don't really know what his real name, his real name was. And it was probably uh, not one person, but a few scholars who contributed. Um, in many cases where, you know, scholarship was put down to one person, it, it was a woman. Uh, but because, obviously, of patriarchy and, and uh, all the other ways we managed to torture ourselves and each other, um, you know, the true authors have not been recognized by history. I always think to myself, if, we, if our ancestors had found a way not to be so afraid of different people and different things and the way different pe people look, then we might have the cure for cancer by now. You know, we'd, we'd be so much farther ahead if we hadn't just focused on, on recognizing intelligence in a very, very narrow um, you know, section of society. So, but uh, as I like to tell my students, um, life is getting much, much better. I know you, you all shake your heads at the moment. But, um, <laughs> but if you think about it, uh, there was a, um, there was a, 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 in 1960, there were about three and a half billion people in the world. Now we have just over seven billion. Now we've been in this genetic form for about 175,000 years. That's a long time, right? And it took 175,000 years to get to three and a half billion. But then it only took 60 years to double that. So we're quite successful you know, at, uh, let's just say, being social. 
Um, but yet, in 60 years, the amount of pain and suffering hasn't doubled. It's actually become less. And actually, if, if most people were to see a picture or a video of somebody in Taiwan or Zimbabwe who was suffering, we would be outraged and we would think, how can we help? That would be our initial thought. So in many ways, statistically, you could argue that the world is infinitely better. Um, and if you also talk to a historian you know, and ask which period in history would you go back to to live, I can almost say with some knowledge that they would say, well, I'm here, how I'll stay here. Because historically, you know, the way we look at um, people is sort of with a mixture of curiosity and disgust. Like, how could they have done certain things? How could they have behaved in certain ways? And I always wonder what people of the future will look back and say about us. What are we doing now that we don't realize is so terrible? Um, and what do we realize that we don't have that will be so vital to people in the future? Um, so let's see, um, let me read a little from Lao Tzu. Uh, If what you're talking about is the Tao, then what you're not talking about is the Tao. The name can, that can be named is not the eternal name. The unnameable is the eternally real. Naming is the origin of all particular things. Free from desire, you realize the mystery. Caught in desire, you see only manifestation. Yet mystery and manifestations arise from the same source. This source is called darkness. Darkness within darkness is the gateway to all understanding. Every being in the universe is an expression of the Tao. It springs into existence unconscious, perfect, free, takes on a physical body, lets circumstances complete it. That is why every living being spontaneously honors the Tao. The Tao gives birth to all beings, nourishes them, maintains them, cares for them, comforts them, protects them, takes them back to themselves, creates without possessing, acts without expecting, guides without interfering. This is why love of the Tao is the very nature of things. Empty your mind of all thoughts and let your heart be at peace. Watch the turmoil of beings, contemplate their return. Each separate being in the universe returns to the common source. Returning to the source is serenity. If you don't realize the source, you stumble in confusion and sorrow. When you realize where you come from, you naturally become tolerant, disinterested, amused, kind-hearted as a grandmother, dignified as a king. Immersed in the wonder of the Tao, you can deal with whatever life brings you. And when death comes, you're ready. The ancient masters were profound and subtle. Their wisdom was unfathomable. There's no way to describe it. All we can describe mm, is their appearance. They were careful as somebody crossing an iced over stream, alert as a warrior in enemy territory, courteous as a guest, fluid as melting ice, shapeable as a block of wood, receptive as a valley, clear as a glass of water. Do you have the patience to wait till your mud settles and the water is clear? Can you remain unmoving till the right action arises by itself? The master doesn't seek fulfillment. Not seeking, not expecting. She is present and she welcomes all things. So that's the biggest little book I've ever, I've ever read, the Tao Te Ching, uh, which I suppose means sort of the way of truth or the, the, the chosen way. Or, or um, uh, A good translation, if you're interested, is by Stephen Mitchell. Um, let me move on to um, uh, Ancient Greece and Rome. 
So of course, looking at say 600 BC to you know maybe 4 500 AD with the fall of the Roman Empire, the Greeks and the Romans had very different views of, of love than we do. Um, up until quite recently, you might be surprised to learn that marriage was, with few exceptions, arranged, not through um, romantic or erotic uh, association, but uh, with people who might bring more wealth into the family. Or with, with the poor, it was people who would be practi practical, you know, which family should we ally with? You know, if we have sheep and they have field, they, they work the soil here, that would be a nice, uh, harmonious, uh, y you know, unifying gesture. So we'll marry. And of course, the wealthy would marry predominantly for power or for peace. You know, kings would marry off their their um, children to people in faraway kingdoms for some kind of you know gain through trade or, or to ensure a peace treaty. It was common, um, which might explain why in the 1300s the idea of courtly love or chivalry became very popular, um, which was where an older married woman would be given love service. Don't look so excited. Dude. That kind of um, it would be. It was a better kind. It was presence and, and attention and opening doors. And um, uh, where an older married woman, usually in an aristocratic uh, context, would be given love service by um, by a younger man uh, who would a knight who would dream about her and write poetry for her and just adore her. Um, in theory, these relationships were not supposed to be consummated. But I'm sure many were, um, especially if the married, the man married to the woman, had dismissed her from his gallery of pleasures um, because he was maybe never really interested in her physically or emotionally to begin with, because it was an arranged marriage. So when we think about, oh God, our ancestors were always cheating on each other, it's often because they didn't get to choose who they married. Um, so, so we have to forgive them a little bit. Um, and one thing that always shocks my students at the School of Visual Arts when we talk about Greece and Rome is how the, the, in the classical world, sexual intercourse was seen as an appetite, nothing more. There was nothing really spiritual or, um, I mean, it was intimate, but it was the physical intimacy was really the only portion. So, um, so for instance, um, there were brothels. If you ever visit Pompeii, you'll see that the remains of the brothel are next to the bakery. So if you popped out for a, a loaf of bread, you could also you know, go next door quickly and get some relief. Um, anybody could go. It was completely normal service. It was, like, um, it was more normal than even going for a massage today. Um, so I suppose that when I explain to my students, I say, if somebody's looking at um, naked people on the internet, which I hear is quite common, um, then um, it would be the same as looking at a hamburger menu in a diner room you know, when you're hungry. Oh, look at that nice cheeseburger. Oh, it would be exactly the same thing. They saw sex as just an appetite to be satisfied and then it'll come back after a little while. Um, in, terms of, in terms of love, there must have been love relationships that we have, the type that we have today. But they weren't really written about very much, or they weren't really <laughs> celebrated as much. Um, the, um, they saw sex as an appetite, and um, men had, um, especially wealthy men, had a lot of power and rights when it came to sex. But women had none. Women were completely disenfranchised from absolutely everything. They couldn't even leave the villa without permission from the husband or the eldest son. Um, so men would routinely have sex with their slaves. Um, they have sex with, um, and in fact, in Hebrew, thou shalt not commit adultery. In Hebrew, it means you can't have sex with another man's wife because she's his property. But you can have sex with slaves and women who don't aren't owned by somebody um, in the f familial way. Um, so, of course, thou shalt not commit adultery nowadays has been interpreted as you know, don't send erotic messages on Facebook to your ex-boyfriend or girlfriend. So it's, it's different. 
Um, and I wonder if that's why the ancients set their holy books in language, so that the ambiguity would allow the wisdom to evolve uh, culturally. Um, however, saying that, as somebody who considers himself romantic, I think that um, there were marriages where there was not what we would consider infidelity. For instance, um, you've all heard the word echo, you know, when you go to the mountains and you shout something and then you hear it. Um, so the, the, of course the Greeks saw that as an etiological story, uh, something that explains why something is the way it is, because, you know, for them the idea of an echo would have been supernatural. So the story goes that uh, Zeus, king of the gods, came down to the mountain to have sex with a mountain nymph. And um, Hera trailed him, his wife. And uh, she got talking to a man, another mountain nymph. And this nymph talked so much because she wanted to distract Hera from finding her husband having sex, sex with this mountain nymph. Um, and when Hera found out what she was doing, she took away her voice. And she gave her, the only way she could speak would be to repeat the last thing she hears. Um, hence, echo, where we get the word echo from the mountain nymph of that name. But from a writer's point of view, it seems that if, it, if men could have sex with anybody with impunity in the ancient world, why would Hera punish echo unless she was annoyed? So even though women had no executive power, uh, I still think that they would have had a sort of social power um, where they would have made it clear that if men engage in sex with slaves, that it would have, you know, tarnished the trust that you can build over time with somebody. Um, uh, of course, in the Torah, there were very strict, I have an English edition here, there were very strict rules. Uh, but my students are always interested to know that in Hebrew, thou shalt not kill, actually means thou shalt not murder. So you can kill, you can kill. It's fine. Go ahead. You just can't murder anybody. Um, and the difference between that is for another conversation. Um, so I'm in, um, I'm in Leviticus. Um, so as you know, the Torah is the first five books of the Christian Old Testament. Um, and of course, for Christians, the New Testament is a bi uh, an oral biography of Jesus. So Jesus is like told by the people who knew him. Uh, I guess Jesus didn't like writing. Um, you shall keep my laws. Uh, Lord, um, Yahweh is speaking to Moses. Uh, you shall keep my laws and my norms by the pursuit of which man shall live. I am the Lord. None of you shall come near any one of his own flesh to uncover nakedness. I am the Lord. So there's the big incest rule there. Your father's nakedness, that is, the nakedness of your mother, you shall not uncover. She is your mother. You shall not uncover her nakedness. Do not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife. It is the nakedness of your father. The nakedness of your sister, your father's daughter, or your mother's, whether born into the household or outside, don't uncover their nakedness. The nakedness of your son's daughter or of your daughter's daughter, do not uncover their nakedness, for their nakedness is yours. The nakedness of your father's wife's daughter, who was born into your father's household, she is your sister. Don't uncover her nakedness. And it goes on and on and on. Um, do not defile yourselves in any of these ways. Um, so there were, there were very uh, strict rules about how to conduct oneself. Um, and I suppose one of the great failures for us as a people at the moment is that we've been unable to reconcile our animal brain with our thinking brain. You know, we're constantly in conflict with ourselves, especially driving. You know, if you had rockets in the front of your car, I guarantee we all would have fired them by now. Um, so, you know, but then the thinking brain kicks in, you know, don't do that, it's a terrible idea. That person could, you know, their father could have cancer, or, you know, maybe they're having a bad day and they're just driving erratically. So, um, the idea of what's natural to us can sometimes not bring us happiness. You know, what the feeling brain wants, you know, sex and, you know, and um, power often isn't what allows us to have sort of harmony in our lives. Let me um, move on a little bit, flash forward in time. 
to um, some poetry. And this is, uh, this is John Donne. The, um, the rise in uh, the rise in the idea of romantic love as being like when you know you look up in the dictionary you expect to see that sort of definition probably came about as a result of courtly love in the 12th and 13th centuries um, and also it's worth mentioning that um, up until you know maybe the even the 1800s there was no such thing as the individual um, in the 1500s you would sleep in the same room as your family, you would work in the same fields as your family, you'd eat the same food. There was no privacy. I mean, nowadays, if you need milk, everybody would go to 7-Eleven to get milk. Everybody would come back. Um, it was really the group mentality. And even up, to, up until recently in China, you know, when I have young Chinese students, they say that their parents say, you shouldn't ask yourself, what do I want to do? You should say, what can I do that would benefit the family? And this is a, you know, a deep part of Confucian Chinese culture, which is why Chinese people's last names comes first. You know, so Chan Li, Chan would be their surname. Uh, and uh, you know, to suggest that the family, the group, is more important than the individual. Um, of course, the in individualism was really celebrated in the Romantic era, you know, when, um, as a reaction to classicism and to the logic and order which came about as a result of the Enlightenment in the 1700s, you know, romantic poets really started to, uh, to engage their readers with the sense of the self, satisfaction of the self, and nature, you know, a reaction against uh, industrialization. Um, and then, of course, we had modernism in the 1920s, which railed against romanticism, the excesses of emotion, which had risen up and contributed to the First World War. Um, still trying to find John Donne. <laughs> um, William Blake actually is a, a very interesting poet. If somebody said that Simon, somebody that in, is in your library came from space, from another planet, I'd automatically assume it was William Blake. Um, he was born in London in the 1700s. And uh, he became an engraver by profession. That's where he would engrave metal, and then uh, ink would be put on it. And so if you wanted uh, copies of pictures of your house, engraving and printing was the way to do it. Um, but he was always very, very odd. For instance, he, he said that he could see souls of all things, and he could see the dead. And that when he had a problem with his machine, uh, a dead person would come and help him fix it. Or if he had a problem with the technology of printing, a dead person would say, well, you need to put the ink on this way. So he said he felt he could see even the souls of fleas. Uh, and he said the dead, the souls of the dead like to congregate in trees. They just sort of hang there looking. Um, and he married uh, a, a girl who was illiterate. And he taught her to read and write. And then she, so she became, they sort of worked together. And he uh, engraved all his books of poetry. And he was largely unrecognized in his time. And people thought that he was just a harmless lunatic. Um, but now scholars looking at the works of Blake realize that we, we just don't know really. Um, it's just so incredibly difficult and dense to figure out what he was trying to to suggest. Maybe that we're all part of some great spiritual glowing center, but then we're individual parts. So we're, we're one thing, God, but we've all been separated into pieces, which actually is quite Asian in a way, isn't it? Um, so Blake felt the only way to find your way to spiritual harmony and to bliss and to happiness and love is to trust your imagination, not to trust your intellect, which is practical. Um, I'm going to move on now to, um, I'm going to skip John Donne, I just couldn't find him, uh, to a writer, um, oh I just found John Donne, uh, um, 
the dream. Dear love, for nothing less than thee would I have broke this happy dream, if it was a theme for reason much too strong for fantasy. Therefore thou wakest me wisely, yet my dream thou brokest not, but continuest it. Thou art so truth that thoughts of thee suffice to make dreams truths and fables histories. Enter these arms, for since thou thought it best not to dream all my dream, let's act the rest. As lightning or a taper's light, thine eyes and not thy noise waked me. Yet I thought thee, for thou lovest truth, an angel at first sight. But when I saw thou sawest my heart, and knewest my thoughts beyond an angel's art, when thou knewest what I dreamt, when thou knewest when excess of joy would wake me, and calmst then, I must confess, it could not choose but be profane to think thee anything but thee, coming and staying, showed thee, thee but rising makes me doubt that now thou art not thou. That love is weak, when fears as strong as he, tis not all spirit pure and brave, if mixture it of fear, shame, and honour have. Perchance, as torches, which must ready be, men light and put out, so thou dealst with me. Thou comest to kindle, goest to come, then I will dream but hope again, but else would die. So it does require a bit of translation, I think, from the uh, vernacular at that time. Um, one of my favourite writers, it was quite modern actually, and she, uh, she wrote in the 1930s and 40s. Um, she was, uh, in the, when the Nazis invaded Europe, she became a spy. Um, and uh, she was captured though in 1944, and she was um, decapitated, which was a normal way for the Nazis to deal with people they didn't like. Um, And um, I think she would have become a very important, a more important writer if she'd lived. She was only 30 when she was executed. And this is from her story, The Kind Elephant. And it's a book of what she considers love stories. And her name was uh, Noor Inayat Khan. Far, far in the sandy desert was a small oasis of palm trees and flowers. And in that oasis, as a lonely hermit lived an elephant. He ate the fruit of the trees and drank from a little stream of water that ran through the rocks. Happy he was, that elephant, dancing through the banana trees, watching day and night come over the desert. But one day, as he was dancing along, in the distance some strange voices came to his ears. Whose are those voices? He said to himself. Are they not voices of men? Unhappy men? Who are those men, and why do they cross the desert? Hmm, they must be lost. Maybe they suffer some terrible pain. Such were the thoughts of the handsome elephant as he walked in the direction of the voices. He walked some distance over the burning sand when he came upon a great crowd of men all huddled together at death's door. And at the piteous sight, his eyes for the first time in his happy life filled with tears. Oh, travellers, he said to them in a tender voice, where do you come from? Where are you going? Have you lost your way in the desert? Tell me, maybe I can help in some way. So happy were the people to hear this, these friendly words that they fell on their knees before him. Beautiful one, they said, beautiful elephant, we've been driven from our country by our own king and have roamed through the desert for many days. Not a drop of water have we found to drink nor food to give us strength. Help us, oh dear one, they cried. Help us, please, we're so hungry. How many are you? asked the elephant. We are 1,000, they replied, but many have already died. The elephant gazed at them. One of them was crying for water, another begging for food. You're weak, he said and the next city is too far for you to reach without food and drink. I think you should walk towards that hill over there. At the foot of a cliff on the far side, you will find the body of a large elephant. 
which will provide you with food, and nearby runs a stream of sweet water where you can drink. When he's thus spoken, he ran over the burning sand and disappeared. Where did the elephant go, the people said? Where did he run at such a pace? Straight to the cliff he went, to the same cliff he pointed out to the men. But he took another way, so they might not see him going and feel guilty. He climbed to the top, and then from its highest point, he hurled his beautiful body to the ground below. When the men reached the spot, they gazed at the giant form, and a great fear seized them. Isn't this our dear elephant? said one of them. This face is the same face. These eyes are the same eyes. And they all sat together in the sand and wept bitterly. After some time, one among them spoke. Companions, he said, we cannot eat this elephant who has given his life for us. No, said another, if we do not eat this elephant, his sacrifice will have been useless, and we shall die before reaching another city. Thus, we shall not be helped, nor shall the wish of our kind elephant be fulfilled. The men spoke no more, but bent their heads in the burning sand, and ate the elephant meat with tears in their eyes. And it made them strong, very strong, so that they were able to cross the desert and reach a town where they could have families and their troubles were at an end. But they never forgot the great elephant. Now, to ruin that wonderful sense of closure for that story, I shall read a quote from Winston Churchill, uh, long before World War II, when he was speaking in the, uh, I think, in the House of Lords. He said, he was debating about whether to pass, whether to make laws when it comes to sexual behaviors in, in Britain. And he said, it's impossible to obtain a conviction. He says, there'll never be a law against sodomy uh, in England. It will always be impossible for sodomy, uh, to have a sodomy conviction from an English jury. He said, because half the government doesn't believe it's possible, and the other half is doing it. <laughs> Um, a lot of love stories, modern love stories, aren't really about love itself, but about what love isn't. And so they, they seek to warn us against things that aren't love. Um, and uh, for instance, there's a story, actually I think I'll read, by Raymond Carver. Uh, and he's a modern writer. He was a UPS driver for most of his life. And he, he smoked and drank heavily, and that killed him in the end. Um, but people like his stories because they're accessible, but they also have a sort of wisdom in them that they like. So I will read uh, one of his... Uh, one of his... If I have time. Um, I'll read some, and then if you like it, you can always get the book. I'm sure his book is here in the library. What we talk about when we talk about love. My friend Mel McGuinness was talking. Mel McGuinness is a cardiologist and sometimes that gives him the right. The four of us were sitting around his kitchen table drinking gin. Sunlight filled the kitchen from the big window behind the sink. There were Mel and me and his second wife, Teresa, Terry we called her, and my wife, Laura. We lived in Albuquerque then, but we were all from somewhere else. There was an ice bucket on the table. The gin and the tonic water kept going round, and we somehow got on the subject of love. Mel thought real love was nothing less than spiritual love. He said he'd spent five years at a seminary before quitting to go to medical school. He said he still looked back on those years in the seminary as the most important years in his life. Terry said the man she lived with before she lived with Mel loved her so much he tried to kill her. And then Terry said, he beat me up one night. He dragged me around the living room by my ankles. He kept saying, I love you, I love you, you bitch. He went on dragging me around the living room. My head was knocking on things. Terry looked around the table. What do you do with love like that? 
She was a bone-thin woman with a pretty face, dark eyes, and brown hair that hung down her back. She liked necklaces made of turquoise and long pendant earrings. My God, don't be silly, that's not love. And you know it, Mel said. I don't know what you'd call it, but I sure know you wouldn't call that love. Say what you want to, but I know it was, Terry said. It may sound crazy to you, but it's true just the same. People are different now. Sure, sometimes he may have acted crazy, okay, but he loved me. In his own way, he loved me. There was love there, so don't say there wasn't. Mel let out a long breath. He held his glass and turned to Laura and me. The man actually threatened to kill me, Mel said. He finished his drink and reached for the gin bottle. Terry's a romantic. Terry's at the kick me so I know you love me school. Terry, hon, don't look that way. Mel reached across the table and touched her cheek with his fingers. Now he wants to make up, Terry said. Make up what, Mel said. What's there to make up? I know what I know, that's all. How do we get started on this subject anyway, Terry said. She raised her glass and drank from it. Mel always has love on his mind. Don't you, honey? She smiled. And I thought that was the last of it. I just wouldn't call Ed's behavior love. That's all I'm saying, honey. What about you guys, Mel said to Laura and me. Does that sound like love to you? I'm the wrong person to ask, I said. I don't even know the man. I've only heard his name mentioned in passing. I wouldn't know. You'd have to know particulars. But I think what you're saying is that love is an absolute. Mel said, the kind of love I'm talking about is the kind of love I'm talking about is it, you don't try to kill people, basically. <laughs> Laura said, I don't know anything about Ed or anything about the situation. Who can judge anyone else's situation? I touched the back of Laura's hand. She gave me a quick smile. Then I picked up her hand. It was warm. The nails polished, perfectly manicured. I encircled the broad wrist with my fingers, and I held her. When I left, said Terry, he drank rat poison. She clasped her arms with her hands. They took him to the hospital in Santa Fe. That's where we lived then, about 10 miles out. They saved his life, but his gums went crazy from it. I mean, they pulled away most of his teeth. After that, the other teeth that remained stood out like bangs. My God, Terry said. She waited a minute and let go of her arms and picked up her glass. Wow, what people won't do, Laura said. He's out of action now, Mel said. He's dead. Mel handed me the saucer of limes. I took a section, squeezed it over my drink, and stirred the ice cubes with my finger. It gets worse, Terry said. He shot himself in the mouth, but he bungled that too. Poor Ed, she said. Terry shook her head. Poor Ed, nothing, Mel said. He was dangerous. Mel was 45 years old. He was tall and rangy, with curly, soft hair. His face and arms were brown from tennis. When he was sober, his gestures, all his movements were precise, very careful. He did love me though, Mel. Grant me that, Terry said. That's all I'm asking. Grant me that. He didn't love me the way you love me. I'm not saying that, but he loved me. You have to grant me that. What do you mean? I said. He bungled it. Laura leaned forward with her glass. She put her elbows on the table and held her glass in both hands. She glanced from Mel to Terry and waited with a look of bewilderment on her open face, as if amazed that such things happened to people you were friends with. How did he bungle it when he killed himself is what I mean, I said. I'll tell you what happened, Mel said. He took this 22 pistol he bought to threaten Terry and me with, and I'm serious, he was always threatening people. You should have seen the way we lived in those days, like fugitives. I even bought a gun myself. Can you believe it? A guy like me, a physician. But I did. I bought it, one for self-defense, for the glove box, and another, you know, to leave with the apartment in the middle of the night when I had to go to the hospital, you know? Terry and I weren't married then, and my first wife had the house and kids and the dog and everything. Terry and I were living in this apartment. Sometimes I'd say, I'll get a call in the middle of the night and have to go to the hospital at two in the morning. And it would be dark out there in the parking lot, and I'd break into a sweat before I even got to my car. I never knew if he was going to come the shrubbery, you know? I mean, the man was crazy. He was capable of wiring a bomb, anything. He used to call my medical service at all hours and say he needed a doctor. And when I'd return the call, he'd say, Son of a bitch, your days are numbered. <laughs> Little things like that. I was scared. I was scary, I'm telling you. I still feel sorry for him, Terry said. 
Oh, it sounds like a nightmare, Laura said. But what exactly happened after he shot himself? Laura is a legal secretary. We met in a professional capacity. And before we knew it, it was a courtship. She's 35, three years younger than I am. In addition to being in love, we like each other and enjoy one another's company. And she's easy to be with. So that's all I'll read of that story. Uh, there's about five more pages. Um, Roman Carver is a pretty exceptional writer, I think. Um, another story he writes, uh, you know, they're all founded in love somehow. Another story is about a couple who have been dating for about a year and they live together. And the woman is a nurse and her husband is a, a construction worker. Oh, yeah, her boyfriend. And um, her best friend in, in college was a blind man. And so uh, she says uh, to her boyfriend, you know, John is coming to stay for a few days. And her boyfriend is like, okay, but I just think it's weird that your best friend is like a guy, but also a blind guy. And she's like, well, try and be nice to him, you know, because I'll be on my shift when he arrives. So the blind guy arrives, and the boyfriend is just, so, you want to watch TV? Oh, what, you know, he doesn't know what to do, it's awkward. And then um, after a while, you know, they're talking and talking, and he says to the blind guy, have you ever smoked pot? And the blind guy says, no, no, but I would. So then um, the guy gets the blind, they smoke marijuana, and then they put on PBS, and there's a documentary about cathedrals, and the blind guy is fascinated by a cathedral. And the boyfriend says, oh yeah, of course you've never seen one. So then he ends up getting into the armchair behind the blind guy, putting his hands over his hands, and they put pencils in each hand, and he draws a cathedral. And then the wife gets home, the girlfriend comes home from the hospital and sees them sitting in the same armchair, hunched over each other, drawing pictures. And that's how the story ends. Um, so all these stories are strange, but as you can tell, they sound like real people, like people you know. Um, a lot of young college students get into reading and writing because of Raymond Carver. Um, so now to, uh, to finish things up, I'm going to read uh, some, a little bit of uh, what would be considered philosophy. Um, and this is from a, uh, a chap called uh, Krishnamurti, who was um, writing in the 1950s. And I'll read a little uh, explanation of his style and what he focused on. Krishnamurti was born in India in 1895. He's considered by many as a divinely inspired being or a guru. Um, his book on love and loneliness uh, deals with um, why we need love. The idea that why we need love might not be as useful as why we think we need love. Krishnamurti believes that our minds often get stuck in a pattern of seeing things a certain way. And without investigation, we may find that our mind is a barrier to authentic love. Because we're too busy seeking what we think is love based on an unexamined view of the world. Krishnamurti argues that a person's need for love, a person's longing for love as a means to an end, is not actually a need for love, but a need for stimulation and that a need for fulfillment through another person is certainly not love. So this is um, his, him writing, his writing. We were discussing the complex problem of love, and I don't think we shall understand it until we understand an equally complex problem which we call the mind. Have you noticed, when we're very young, how inquisitive we are? We want to know. We want to see many more things than older people. We observe if we are at all awake, things that older people do not notice. The mind, when we are young, is much more alert, much more curious and wanting to know. That is why when we are young, we learn so easily mathematics, geography. As we grow older, our minds become more and more crystallized, more and more heavy, more and more bulky. Have you noticed in older people how prejudiced they can be? Their minds are fixed, they are not open. They approach everything from a fixed point of view. You are young now, but if you are not very watchful, you will also become like that. It's not then very important to understand the mind and to see whether you cannot be supple, be capable of instant adjustments, of extraordinary capacities in every department of life, of deep research and understanding, instead of gradually becoming dull. 
Should you not know the ways of the mind so as to understand the way of love? Because it is the mind that destroys love. Clever people, people who are cunning, do not know what love is because their minds are so sharp, because they're so clever, because they're so superficial, which means to be on the surface. And love is not a thing that exists on the surface. What is the mind? I'm not talking about the brain, the physical construction of the brain about which any um, physiologist will talk to you about. The brain is something which reacts to various nervous responses. But you're going to find out what the mind is. The mind says, I think, it is mine, it is yours, I am hurt, I am jealous, I love, I hate, I am Indian, I am Muslim, I believe in this, I do not believe in that, I know, you do not know, I respect, I despise, I want, you do not want, I am happy, I am not happy. What is this thing? Until you understand it, until you are familiar with the whole process of thinking, which is the mind, until you are aware of that, you will gradually, as you grow older, become hard, crystallized, dull, and fixed in a certain pattern of thinking. What is this thing that you call the mind? It is the way of thinking, the way you think. I am talking of your mind, not somebody else's mind, but the way it would think, the way you feel, the way you look at trees, at a fish, the way you consider the villager. That mind gradually becomes warped or fixed in a certain pattern. When you want something, when you desire, when you crave, when you want to be something, then you set a pattern. That is, your mind creates a pattern and gets caught. Your desire crystallizes your mind. Say, for example, I want to be very rich. The desire of wanting to be wealthy creates a pattern and my thinking then gets caught in it. And I can only think in those terms and I cannot go beyond it. So the mind gets caught in it and gets crystallized in it and gets hard and dull. Or if I believe in something, in God, or say a certain political system, the very belief begins to set the pattern because that belief is the outcome of my desire. And that desire strengthens the walls of the pattern. Gradually, my mind becomes dull, incapable of adjustment, of quickness, of clarity, because I'm caught in the labyrinth of my own desires. So until I really investigate the process of my mind, the way I think, the way I regard love, until I'm familiar with my own ways of thinking, how can I possibly find what love is? There will be no love when my mind desires certain facts of love, certain actions of it. And then when I then imagine what love should be, then I give certain motives to love. So gradually I create the pattern of action with regard to love. But it is not love. It's merely my desire of what love should be. Say, for example, I possess you as a wife or a husband. Do you understand possess? You possess your jacket or your coat. If somebody took them away, you would be angry, you would be anxious, you would be irritated. Why? Because you regard your jacket or your coat as yours, your property. You possess it. Because through possession, you feel enriched. Through having many coats, many cars, you feel rich. Not only physically rich, but inwardly rich. So when somebody takes your coat, you feel irritated because inwardly you're being deprived of that feeling of being rich, that feeling of possession. Owning creates a barrier with regard to love. If I own you, possess you, is that love? I possess you as I possess a car or a jacket, because in possessing I feel very rich, I depend on it. It's very important to me inwardly. This owning, this possessing, this depending is what we call love. But if you examine it, you'll see that behind it, the mind feels satisfied in possession. After all, when you possess a coat, or many coats, or a car, or a house, inwardly it gives you a certain satisfaction, the feeling that it's yours. So the mind, desiring, wanting, creates a pattern, and in that pattern it gets caught and the mind grows dull and stupid and thoughtless. The mind is the centre of that feeling of the mind, the feeling that I own something, that I'm a big man, that I'm a little man, that I'm insulted, that I'm flattered, that I'm clever, that I'm attractive, that I'm stupid, that I'm ambitious, that I'm the daughter of somebody or the son of somebody. That feeling of the me, the I, is the very centre of the mind, the mind itself. So the more the mind feels, this is mine, and builds walls around that feeling that I'm somebody, that I must be great, that I'm very clever, the more it creates a pattern, the more it becomes enclosed and dull, and then it suffers. Then there is pain in that enclosure. Then it says, what am I going to do? Then it struggles to find something else instead of removing the walls that are enclosing it by thought, by careful awareness, by going inside, by trying to understand. 
it wants to take something from outside and close it in with itself. So gradually, the mind becomes a barrier to love. So without understanding that part of life, of what the mind is, of the way of thinking, of the way you see love, of the way from which there is action, you can't find love. You can't possibly know what it is. Um, later on, somebody asks Krishnamurti uh, in, a, in, a, in a university, uh, how do I find love? And he gives the famous answer. He says, you don't find love, you just remove everything from your life that isn't love. Mm -hmm. Which I quite like. Mm -hmm. um, another Indian um, guru uh, who was very famous in the 60s uh, called Rajneesh. Um, Rajneesh, do you remember him? He said, Moses, in, he says, uh, Moses invests, Jesus saves, Rajneesh spends. He was. He had, a, you know, a fleet of Rolls Royces. Remember the Beatles mm. used to follow yeah. him, and um, eventually the SCIA got rid of him. He had to go back to India because he was setting up communes. But uh, he'd have these very famous, uh, you know, things where he'd go and stand on a balcony and people would call out questions. And you could ask him anything: engineering, William Blake, you know, techniques of oil painting, and he always had an answer. And some of the famous ones, uh, a man said. My wife has been unfaithful to me, what should I do? And Rajni shook his head and said, I feel that you're in pain. He says, but the question isn't, has she been unfaithful to you? The question is, has she been unfaithful to herself? Um, so a lot of these, um, these Indian mystics from the 50s and 60s are quite interesting. Um, of course, Desmond Morris, the zoologist who you might know as the author of um, the uh, naked ape. He would have said that Krishnamurti is not showing you the, the whole picture. Because the reason that we want to be rich, the reason that we want a house and a nice car uh, and money, is not because uh, we're, we're being boxed in by our mind, but because of the animal brain's desire for safety. You know, if we have a house, then we have safety, a place to live. These are innate desires that, that you know, we, we share with our primate cousins. Um, so, when I talked earlier about the inab uh, inability to be able to reconcile the animal brain and the thinking brain, we see it too in, in literature and philosophy. You know, people just t talking about the mind but not talking about, you know, the, those, the, um, the things that have kept us alive, you know, many, many years ago. Um, so, I think I'm sort of coming to an end. I definitely chose too many things to, to read. No, that was um, but if anyone has any um, questions... Sorry, could you repeat the name of the author who became a spy and then wh whose piece you read? Oh yeah, Noor Inyad Khan. Can you spell that? Yeah, N-O-O-R I-N-H-A-Y-A-T K-H-A-N And uh, her film, most famous book is called 20 Jakarta Tales. Um, and she was the daughter of, uh, I think, an English aristocrat and an Indonesian diplomat. And she spoke many, many languages. She was very attractive and so perfect as a spy. Did she grew up in Britain? Uh, in I believe so, yeah. The perfect spy until, of course, she was caught. Um, yeah, one book she, she wrote. Okay. Um, anyone have any questions? I'd be happy to try and answer them. A million. Uh -oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Actually, wonderful. And um, I'm wondering if everybody feels love and defines love in a different way. Mm -hmm. I had a conversation. I'm going to be 90 years old, mm -hmm. so I look back at my life mm -hmm. and I said, "Did I really love my first husband?" Mm -hmm. Did I really love my second husband? Because my first husband was so different from my second husband. How could I say which one was real love? And so I was discussing with my friend the love that I feel when I feel I'm in love is an expansion of myself. It kind of opens the world to me 
and opens my mind because you said about the mind. My mind, I feel at my age, is not closed. It is still open and still searching and looking for life. And the person I love, I want everyone to love, and I want you to share this person with this wonderful feeling because I thought he was so terrific. And the person I was talking to said, no, 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 I love because I want this person only to myself, and I don't want anyone else to share this. So when I got you a flyer, when I saw it, I said, I'm going to call, maybe he has an answer. <laughs> and that's why now, for me, it was such an expansive, joy, happy, I could solve every problem because it made me smarter, because it opened me my mind to everything and everyone. And I can't say she's my friend, she's an acquaintance, has narrowed her mind and fixed on this one individual. And she wants to separate him from everyone he cares about. So I said to myself, for me that's not you have an answer. Well, I, I have to say, not just because you're here, but I agree with you. Um, and in fact, you know, there are certain, there are certain, um, obviously, you know, psychological, uh, there's certain uh, such psychological conditions where a person feels safe, but they can alienate someone they love from everyone else who cares about them, because then they feel like they're less likely to be abandoned for somebody else. But by doing that, essentially, they sow the seeds of their own abandonment. It's very interesting. So, your husbands would they have got along with each other? Pardon me. I didn't would your Would your husbands have got along with each other? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I had an entirely different life. Yeah. With the first one and the second one. Yeah. It was, um, and, but the thing is, I had two different lives, and now I have the third because they're both gone. And I'm alone, not you know, alone yeah. without without love. But I love my animals and I love nature, and so it's a whole different yeah. kind of thing. Animals are like children that never grow up. Yeah, they're fun too. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, there's a song from South Pacific. You have to be taught to hate and fear. Do you think you have mm. to be taught to love? Oh, that's a very good question. Mm. What was the question? Um, do we have to be, there's a song from South Pacific that we have to be taught to hate and fear. Yes. Do we also, on the flip side, have to be taught to love? No. That's a very, very interesting question. Um, that sounds like a PhD thesis. Yes. Um, I, w I will say that uh, maybe it's a question of not being taught but learning to appreciate. Because there's a story from India that uh, you know, Otto Rank, the famous psychologist, believed that the root of all evil is not money, but it's fear of death. And then, so we develop religions, all these immortality concepts, and then, ironically, we die in order to feel that we're going to live forever in some imagined zone. So Otto Rank said, if we can get over our fear of death, we'll stop vilifying each other. Um, and um, you know, I thought to myself, well, that's difficult. You know, how is it possible to overcome the fear of death? And then a story from India made me think, well, maybe love is the answer. Because um, the story goes that there's a very rich man and he's dying. And he's had a fantastic life. Um, and uh, he really doesn't want to go. And so, you know, he's a few moments away from death. And um, he, he's pleading with the spirits of the universe. Just, I don't want to die. So then a spirit answers his call and comes to him and says, okay, I've got, a, I've got a way that you can stay alive. And he is so thrilled. You know, he's on his deathbed. And uh, he says, great, great, just tell me what I have to do. And the spirit says, do you see your grandson over there who's, who's four, you know, four years old? And he's like, yeah, I know him, yeah, I love him. And he says, well, all we have to do is you switch places with his soul. 
And the old dying man, after a few moments, says, I'm so happy to die. <laughs> That's one of my favorite stories. Yeah. So maybe one has to be reminded to appreciate death in order to then appreciate um, any natural love that we might feel. It's a very good question. Sorry I give you such a bad answer. No, no. I, you know, come back to me in 10 years. <laughs> but wouldn't you say that, I, but Simon, I would say that, that, you know, with respect, you know, you have to be taught to love. I, I love that, I mean, to hate. I, I really love that song. Because doesn't it seem that the, the, the first feelings that are shared between humans, for instance, at childbirth, are, are, love, are feelings of love. So I would say that it's, really part of, it's, I would say we're wired for that. I mean, that's what I would say. Yeah, I mean, there was a time in our history that we didn't know that sexual intercourse led to conception. So men would not have realized that they had a biological relationship with children. They would have just had a social relationship. And according to anthropologists, we discovered that sex leads to conception about the same time that um, we discovered that every living thing, fruit, vegetable, has the, contains the seeds of its own regeneration. Um, so, I mean, also, back in those times, men would have been terrified of women because every month they would bleed, but they wouldn't be injured. So it must be something supernatural, you know, that they're able to do this and not die, but also that they're able to, at some strange time, just grow another person inside their body. So this, you know, who knows if these were the seeds of patriarchy, where men felt they had to control these powerful beings. I don't know. But can you imagine, you know, John saying, well, you were with Linda last month. Oh, I just think there's a co connection. You know, can you, trying to, can you imagine ancient cave people trying to figure it out? Uh, well, thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it. And uh, have a wonderful Valentine's Day. Thank you.